now, I just had a very, very strong unction that um, in this month that we have deemed the month of answered prayers, by chance we should maybe spend a, a Sunday service going back to the fundamentals of actually letting go and letting God. How to let go and let God do, which mm. intrinsically is what everybody has been talking about today. Amongst us, there are still people obviously waiting for what they consider answered prayers, even though they may have had answered prayers and sort of missed them. Not every miracle is a grand, big miracle. There are many small miracles that happen in our lives every day that we may not notice as miracles. But I think it would be lovely for us to spend time in communion and agreement with one another, really letting Pastor Rob lead us through his principles of sitting back, letting go, and letting God. Let us wait upon the Lord in a completely fundamental way. No matter how we are feeling, if, no matter how anxious, no matter how pressurized we are feeling at this time. And this, as Pastor Rob has said several, is a highly pressurized time with all that is happening in the economy. Mm. But let us wait upon the Lord or learn again fundamentally how to wait upon the Lord in the midst of the chaos so that we too will soar up like eagles. I really think it would be lovely for us to just spend a complete service next Sunday or whichever whatever you choose to just pray and commune and, and learn from Pastor Rob again about truly, truly letting go and letting God do. Uh, I have so much good spring books. <laughs> it's not even next Sunday. Today, it's okay. starting today because it's as if you have looked into my notes, my sermon notes today <laughs> to say these things. This oh God, you are too much. You know what? Eh? Let's just start sermon <laughs> because this is exactly what I'm about to talk about. And you'll be, you'll be amazed. And I didn't discuss it with Sister D. I didn't talk with you. But this thing of letting go and letting go is exactly what I am ministering. Now, how many of you can see on the... How many of you can see... Oh, no, you won't see it because it's a private message I sent to Aaron. But Ar is Aaron there? Aaron has left. Okay, in the message I sent him, I said, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Standing still means just waiting on the Lord. Just, you know, stand still. So this is what we're about to talk about today. It's precisely what we're talking about today. So it's amazing that Sister D is coming up with this. So I think we should just go ahead and start. Um, I had a testimony, but I will defy it till next Sunday. But now she's saying this, I think this is just a confirmation from the Spirit. Um, this may be, for some of us, this may be the trigger that will crystallize the long-awaited miracle. When you listen to, to this message, and it, 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 it came to me like revelation. It just came like a revelation. Do you understand? And I think a lot of this is God just brings it into my spirit and... I, I tried to articulate the words. And interestingly, this dropped in my spirit. So I may not be very articulate, but just get the message. And what makes it now prophetic is the fact that Sister D has said what she says. So when I share this message, then you will compare notes. Does this sync with what she's saying? And could, just, could this be what the Lord is speaking to us in this season? So where I'm going to start with is, I'm going to, um, just give me one second, please. We have, uh, up till this moment, this, this, um, this platform, all I talk to this moment has not been, is not being streamed, but I'm going to start streaming now. So just give me a second.
Right. So let's turn our Bibles. How I'm going to start this sermon, and I want you to listen very carefully because I think it's prophetic. This is a confirmation that God wants you to hear this. And in the text I sent out today, I said that God, God is going to give you an insight into your personal spiritual journey into the promised land. For every one of you, there is a promised land that um, God has given to you. And this promised land, I'm not talking about heaven, I'm talking about here on earth. There is a promised land that we are all met. Please, Mama, can you con 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 um, um, find that from Pamela where she's not here? And Mommy, possibly. Mommy also should be here. Um, maybe if he. So there is a promised land for every one of us. And the promised land is a place of establishment. It's the place of absolute rest. It's a place of prosperity. It's a place of, when I say rest as in rest, in other words, whatever it is that constitutes a need as a need. Need means, means that it is, is it's, um, it's a relevant thing. It's something that is a need which you have to have. If you don't have it, then you will suffer uh, deficiency with consequences. So a, a, the, the promised land is where all needs are satisfied. But the promised land also is a place where all desires are fulfilled. In other words, you come into the place where your dreams begin to get, you begin to realize your dreams. And let me tell you why there is a distinction between needs and desires. Why did Jesus Christ say, I'm the bread of life? If any man come to me, he will not hunger. Hunger is, is a need. It says, that same verse, it says, if any man believe in me, he will not thirst. Thirst, as far as I'm concerned, has to do with your desires. So Jesus Christ is promising as the bread of life, your hunger will be addressed. Your thirst will be addressed. In other words, your needs will be, sat, will be sat, uh, supplied. But your desires, you, God has made us, uh, um, the difference between us and animals or plants is that we have desires. But the animals, all that the animal probably wants is food, is itself, and if it's a meal, sex. That's animal. But for us, we have creative hearts. We have innovative hearts, we have imaginations and all that. And so it says, in that promised land, your needs will be supplied, your thirst will be fulfilled. Now, there is a place, so many of us, let me let you see the Bible uses the Old Testament as a picture for us. And it is like figurative. And from that picture, you are meant to understand, you know, was extrapolated into the New Testament and, you know, apply to yourself, apply to yourself. So look at the Israelites. Whatever happened to the Israelites is a kind of template of our salvation. So the Israelites were in Egypt. Egypt was a place of bondage. Listen to me carefully. Egypt was a place of servitude. Egypt was a place of enslavement. Listen. In Egypt, they didn't have problem. They were guaranteed. They were guaranteed food and shelter. They will. They will eat. They will have shelter provided by the Egyptian government. But they were in slavery, and their masters were past masters that subjected them to hard labor. They they they, they enjoyed the the diets and the. The, 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 the blessings of the Egyptian world. They ate their lovely food, their garlics, their cucumbers, and all. They, they had all that. But there was a problem. They were slaves. You know what it means to be a slave? They can never ever have their own mind. They can never have their own freedom or their own liberty. They can never work in government or work in any corporate institution. Father, child, children, grandchildren, 
will always be laborers. That was the problem. But watch this. God came and delivered them with his glorious power, by his outstretched arm, by signs and wonders. He extricated them, pulled them out by force from the jurisdiction of Pharaoh and the entire Egyptians. Now, when he pulled them out by force, two million people started journeying out of Egypt. Now, because of time, time has gone, I'm going to tell you, just trust my words after you can go back and read it. Bible says, as they came out of Egypt, there was the option. You remember, the whole idea of taking them out of Egypt was to take them to the promised land. As they came out of Egypt, Bible said there was an option of going through the side of the land of the Philistines. That that was a very short way to get into the promised land. But the Bible says, if you read the Bible, the Bible says, God decided not to take them through that way because if they were going to cross through the land of the Philistines, it would have involved a war with the Philistines. And God said, if the, these Israelites, if they see that war with the Philistines, they will run back to Egypt. <laughs> They were wrong, they, so God decided to take them through the wilderness. And in going through the wilderness, it gave time to Pharaoh to change his mind to go after them. So as they were going through the wilderness, what they met now was the Red Sea. And of course, Pharaoh understands the topography of the place. That if these people don't go, didn't go through the land of Philistine, the only other place they can go through will be heading towards the Red Sea. So, Pharaoh said, I know this we cannot go far. They're going to have an obstacle, the Red Sea. Let us chase after them and re, you know, bring them back into bondage. Now, listen. Listen carefully. Bible says, when they got to the point of the Red Sea and they could not proceed, they suddenly discovered that Pharaoh was coming with his entire army. Do you know what the Israelites said? Let me tell you the words they used. The exact words they use. So what they what they are seeing now? Remember, they're out of Egypt, but they're experiencing a problem. They're experiencing a problem, and this problem was an exist existential threat. In other words, their very existence was at stake. So let me tell you the words. Let me show you the words that they used. Exodus 14, verse 11. These are the words that came out of their mouth. They said unto Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt thus with us? To carry us forth out of Egypt. In other words, they are beginning to regret. I beg, I beg, I beg. This whole, you have put us into stress. You have brought us into grave danger. You will have left us in Egypt. Now, let me see. He says, Is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt? Moses saying, Let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than for we to die here in the wilderness. Listen, you are seeing. So their mind is trying to sort out the problem. And their mind, active mind, is saying, you know what? It's better that we continue in servitude than to come out here with this problem. Listen to me. Some people here on this platform and a whole lot of Christians have unconsciously reverted back to a life 
of slavery and servitude, but they don't know. They don't know. They don't know. And that is where today God will give us insight onto what it means to default back to a life of bondage to the Egyptians where you are serving the spirit of Pharaoh at work in your heart without you knowing. You know Moses' response to them, listen carefully now, this is where the rubber hits the road. Moses said to them, Don't be afraid. What was the problem? Fear. Stand firm. Another translation says, Stand still. That's the same word. And see the Lord's salvation, which he will provide for you today. For the Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You must be quiet. Do you prefer me showing you the scriptures or are you happy with me reading it? Which one? Tell me. Go on, Pastor. So clear. Nice. Okay. So he said, you must be quiet. In other words, there is a stillness. The battle is the Lord's battle. Don't interfere. Don't interfere even with your words, even with your considerations, your thoughts, your perspective. Just stand still. Be quiet. Be quiet. Be quiet emotionally. Be quiet mentally. Be quiet psychologically. Be quiet and see the salvation of God. Because this business is the Lord's business. He's the one that initiated it. So you just step back. Take a back seat. Take a back seat. But most importantly, do not entertain fear. That's what Jesus told Jairus. Said, fear not. Only believe. They've told you your daughter is dead. Mm -hmm. Please, please, please. Don't fear. All that's required for you now is believe. Church, let me ask you. Let me ask you. Most intellectuals will say, Robert, wait, 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 wait. You are insulting my sensibility. To tell me that there's danger, and you ask me to stand still, to be quiet, not to do anything, that the Lord will come and help me. That's the biggest problem. A lot of intellectual people, a lot of supposedly wise people, a lot of supposedly people who have made it with their strength, with a lot of, you see, people can be conscientious, can be industrious, can be hardworking, and they have achieved a lot. They, they, they know how to solve problems. They're good at solving problems. But you know the, the issue here? The issue here is that God's strategy is very different from what we call intellectual strategy. What is the st strategy here? Strategy is stand quietly. The Lord will fight for you. It's the right strategy. Let me tell you. This strategy, you see, the strategy is stand quiet. The Lord will fight. These same words were used in Second Chronicles 20, many, many years later, when Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, was attacked by Moab, by Amnon, and several other neighboring countries. They attacked Jehoshaphat. They came in their great numbers. So Jehoshaphat was quite concerned. And what he said is, please, please, everybody, come, 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 come. Let this is a time to seek the face of the Lord and know exactly what do we do. So while they were seeking the face of the Lord, while they were waiting on the Lord, a prophet arose and said, mm. the same words. And he was a musician. This prophet was like a musician as well. He stepped up. 
by the power of the Spirit, the Spirit come upon him and listen to what he said. I'm reading another translation. He said, he's, he, these are his words. He said, this is what God is saying. He says, listen carefully, all Judah and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. And you, King Jehoshaphat, listen. I need more co-hosts. So listen, he said, even you, King Jehoshaphat, listen, all you inhabitants, listen. This is what the Lord says. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged because of the vast number of the enemies you have seen. For the battle is not yours, but God's. You do not need to fight in this battle. Position yourselves. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. He is with you, Judah and Jerusalem. Do not be afraid or discouraged. Tomorrow, go out to face them, for Yahweh is with you. Just go out to face them. Just proceed. But the battle is not yours. So, in the case of Moses, what happened? What God told Moses was, stretch out your rod over the sea. The rod is symbolic of the authority he was carrying as the anointed. Just stretch out your authority. In other words, take authority over the circumstance. As soon as he did that, let me tell you two things that happened. Just listen. I, I don't want to. I, I, I've read it, so just trust me. After the sermon, you can go and read it. As soon as he did that, two things happened. The power of God was brought to bear upon the situation and parted the Red Sea. But another strange, interesting thing happened. The pillar of cloud that led them to that point moved away from the front of the Israelites and came to their back. If you, if sometimes if your eyes can be open to see what is happening in the spirit concerning you, you'll be so encouraged. So the pillar of cloud just shifted position and it came behind them to stand between them and Pharaoh his army. So this is where he, he showed you this battle belongs to God. Not just the, the cloud, but the Bible says specifically, church, go and read it. It says the angel of the Lord also came. The angel of the Lord came and stood. With, I don't know how it is, it's mysterious. But the Bible says the angel of the Lord now got involved directly and came and stood in the midst of the cloud between the Israelites and Pharaoh and Jamie. This tells you that Jehovah had taken over. Man of war. Great man in battle. Listen. The pillar of God was leading them. Bible says that God has a responsibility to guide you. Guide. As in guide you. Guide you. But he also has a responsibility. When the priority is to protect you, God will go into the mode of protection. Or if it means the mode of war, he will. Forget about guidance for now. Just stay where you are. We will guide you later. But right now, we need to protect you. So the role of the, of the, of the cloud, it changed. Shifted from their front, came to their back to protect them. The Bible says that pillar of cloud, if you read it, it says it became light for the Israelites, but became darkness to, the, to Pharaoh and the Egyptians. Then the angel of the Lord appeared in that scene. The angel of the Lord got involved. What was the angel of the Lord doing? If you read what I says, the angel of the Lord 
started removing the wheels of their carriages. He started so that as the the horses were dragging the the carriages, it became a lot stiffer and more difficult. For what reason? So as to give the Israelites more distance from the Egyptians. When the Israelites successfully crossed, they got drowned. Why am I telling you this story? Why am I telling this story? I'm telling you this story because all they needed to do was to stand still. And in standing still, Jehovah took over the battle and wiped out both Pharaoh and the Egyptians. And the word became true. The Egyptians you see today, you will not see again. Church, the same thing happened to Jehoshaphat. Same thing. All he needed to do was to sing praises for his mercies in the river, and God went into battle. Now, Robert, why is this necessary? Immediately after that battle, the pillar of cloud went back to continue the process of leading them. And they were fighting battles. They were, you know, as God directed them, they were enemies, they were overcoming. But remember, when it came to exploring the promised land, the spies that they sent to the promised land, what did they see? They saw giants. They saw the promised land, promising lush, wonderful fruits, but they also saw giants. So they came back to say, this promised land, it's wonderful, it's good, but we cannot possess it because of the obstacles of the giants. How does that affect us? As a result, God said, because you don't believe my word, I need to take you through the process of getting Egypt out of you. I've gotten you out of Egypt, but I need to get Egypt out of you before you can enter the promised land. It took one day, one night, to get them out of Egypt. But it took 40 years to get Egypt out of them before they could enter the promised land. What was the problem? The problem was unbelief. So as they started the journey after the promised land, after the uh, Red Sea, no water. No bread for three days. They went back to complain. We oh, prefer to have been in Egypt. You, you see, there's something that God was trying to dismantle. It is the mindset. They are used to that life. But God is trying to dismantle it. And what is that life? It is the life of slavery. Church, ask me now, as a, as a, as a New Testament believer, how does that apply to us as Christians today? And let me tell you what it is. The way you understand this, let me tell you how God made the distinction between the land of Egypt and the land of promise. God said, let, let, I think this one will read it. God said that the land of Egypt, eh, he said, it's a place where you water your garden on foot, no, you carry water and you'll be going around to water your, your garden. In other words, there is limitation to which you can flourish and prosper in Egypt. Your garden is limited. But he said, in the land where I'm taking you to, 
Hmm? He said, this land, you don't need to water it by food. It's a land that is filled with streams, brooks, fountains, springs, streams, and it has hills and valleys, and it drinks the waters from heaven. So it has a, 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 it has a supernaturally empowered watering system that is not your effort. Then it says in that land, you're going to have a lot of wheat, a lot of barley, a lot of vines, a lot of fig trees, a lot of pomegranates. And then it says in the hills, you dig out, in, in place of stones, you dig out iron. From the mountains, you dig out copper. Then he said that you are going to experience no scarcity. There's no scarceness in that place. Then he says, you will eat your bread with ease. You will, he says, in fact, he says, you will have eat to the full. In other words, he's guaranteeing them in that land you will have satisfaction. Then he says, you will get houses you didn't build. You will get wells you didn't dig. You will get cities that you did not build. So, in other words, he's trying to say, this land of promise is a place of grace and it's a place of rest. You don't fight. You don't labor. You don't struggle. You don't toil. You sit and rest. What are you resting in? You're resting in the Lord because you know. For us as new Christians now, what are we resting in? We are resting in the finished work of redemption. It is so important. The Israelites were required to rest in the word of promise. He says, if you hear what God said, he said, God, God said, I am bringing you to the promised land because of the promise I made to your fathers. It's not because you are good people or because you are great in number. No, no, no. It's because of my covenant with your fathers. I'm bringing you to them. And I have started the process already. You didn't get yourself out of Egypt. You saw the 10 plagues I released to rescue you from Pharaoh. None of you lifted a hand before pharaoh said yes you can go i was the one doing all the work why is it that now if i could deliver you from pharaoh now that pharaoh is threatening you at the red sea why are you thinking that it has to do with you or why are you thinking that the god who delivered you from egypt cannot conquer pharaoh and his chariots before you church we have to change our mindset now many of us you receive salvation you embrace christ you are born again. Your sins are forgiven. You are no longer um, the old person. You are a new creation. But now, what is the life we're meant to live? Listen. Moving from Egypt into the promised land, it took 40 years because of their heart condition. But it doesn't have to take you 40 years. For some people, it, it may take long because God needs to take them through a process of preparing their hearts to be hearts of faith, people that understand the spirit and understand the concept of grace. Now, let me be straight with you. Let me not beat around the bush. The biggest challenge that the average Christian has today the biggest difficulty in getting into the promised land in the New Testament, you know what it is? How many of us know? What is the thing that we're fighting, 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 fighting? That we, when I mean fighting, fighting in terms of faith. To conquer so as to enter the promised land. Do you know what it is? Unbelief. Why is that? Unbelief. Who said that? I didn't see who said it. Ivy. Sister Ivy. Okay. Sister Ivy, let me ask you. 
what is the unbelief that the New Testament believer has today? That God will not fulfill his promise. Or we have to labor for God to provide for us. You're getting it. You know our biggest problem today? Our biggest problem is works. We're finding it difficult to let go. Like Sister D said. We're finding it difficult to seize from our works. He says, he that believeth has entered into his rest. And he that has entered into his rest has seized from his works. So a lot of us unconsciously, you, the things that you don't know, you think that the Israelites knew that their problem was unbelief. If they knew, if they had a few revelation, they would have struggled to at least try to believe. So for us, we are still thinking works. And anybody that is thinking works, what do you think is the root problem? Anybody that feels that his effort must be involved in anything pertaining to him and God, his efforts must be involved. Because there are two things here. You are you deploying your effort to try to accomplish things, as well as you are deploying your efforts to try to engage God. Am I making sense? Many people are trying to do things. They are trying, you see, uh, um, there's a sister that was giving a testimony the other day of the indication of slavery, where she was working. It was slavery. She was being slaved. She was being hard labor. One day she will come up and testify. And when she was about to, she knew it. They give her reports, 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 so that when she finishes from work, she finds out that she can't just leave the office without taking work home because they give her lots of reports to write. So she finds out that she stays on. Sometimes say one o'clock in the morning trying to finish the report because they give it to her as deadline. And she's just a gentle, you know, compliant sister. Hey, if it's me, you're going to have to challenge with me. Now, when it was time for her to go, and time for her, you know, when you're going, you have to get the proper reference and all that. So she spoke to her boss. The boss said, before you can go, he gave her, she gave her 11 reports to write. 11 reports. That it takes one hour to prepare a report. You know what? She did this throughout the night submitted it so for them to let her go church that is enslavement that's enslavement for me let me tell the truth for me i won't even walk there i won't the moment i sense slavery in this place i'm out of there so that that is one that that is how the devil puts us into that kind of situation but the moment you begin to resist slavery that is one aspect the other slavery is where the devil is making you to deploy your own efforts to solve your problem. The devil is giving you the impression that I must do this or do that or you're going on a wild good chase. You will try this, it doesn't work, you try that. And let me tell you, eh, because your, your enemy is a very smart person, he himself will be projecting these options to you. So when one option fails, because you're, you're mentally alert and you, you, you find it difficult to rest mentally, your mind will conjure another option. And the adversary is the one projecting those options onto you. So you're trying that option, you try this option, you try that option. Whatever it is, maybe you're looking for a child, maybe you're looking for healing, maybe you're looking for husband, whatever it is, all kinds of, you keep your mind occupied. You keep your mind occupied. Maybe you'll give a financial breakthrough. You'll just keep your mind. So you keep you keep trying options. But one option you have not tried is to just let go and sit still or stand still and wait for the salvation of the Lord. 
And that place of waiting, you're just thanking him. You're just worshipping him. You're just enjoying his fellowship. And if peradventure you sense it, that you're struggling with unbelief, if you want to go into fasting, you can. What is the essence of your fasting? You are appropriating the strength to refuse and to resist the forces of unbelief. To silence the voice of the flesh. And to be able to muster enough courage to be able to stand still. Just a minute. So, church, let me help you here. Why is it that some people have a lot more? For some people, it's easier to flow. It's easier to believe. For others, it's, it's a bit more difficult. But do you know the problem? The thing is that many of us do not know that we're... Um, I'm looking for the word. We are, let me call it demand driven. So we're seeing more demand. There's a demand that's constantly being placed on our hearts. So you're, you're, you, it's as if your mind feels that it must respond to demands for you to have that breakthrough or that healing or that victory or that answers to prayers. Because that's how your mind is configured. So you are you are responding to a, the voice of demand that is constantly echoing in your in your mind. But why will that happen? It is because I'm not following my notes now. I'm just looking as I'm there. It's because of your past experience. I'm just trying to explain to you why some people it is easier for them to just believe the gospel, believe the word of grace, and all that, than others. And I'm saying, why some people find it more difficult is because of what they've been, what they've experienced before now, what they've been taught, what they are used to, what they have been indoctrinated with over the years. Now, I'm going to give you two examples in the Bible and where Christ said, these are ex ex instances of great faith. In fact, one of them says, I've never seen such great faith in the entire, entire Israel. So one was the centurion. He said, wow, this is such great faith. I haven't seen this kind of faith before. The other one was the Syrophoenician woman whose daughter was demonized. And Jesus said, wow, this is great faith. I haven't seen this type of faith in Israel. Now, the centurion said, I'm not worthy for you to come into my house. Speak the word, my servant will be healed. Wow! Speak the word, my servant will be healed. What is the common denominator between the centurion and the Syrophoenician woman? Who knows? These are the two people that Jesus himself confirmed that they have great faith that impressed him. What is the common denominator? What is common to both of them? Why do you think these two people found it easy to demonstrate great faith? Meanwhile, his disciples is telling them, why does thou have little faith? Even his disciples who are following him every day. Sister, if you want to say something. Um, they are not Jews. They are, I know they're Gentiles. They're not Jews. Um, because they, they, they were not, they didn't listen to the law. They were not law driven. Okay. Okay. Tim, let's hear you. I'll get back to what you said. I was going to say they were outside the culture. So they hadn't grown up with uh, the indoctrination of the, 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 the culture. Yeah the rules and uh, and how things are supposed to be. Okay. You, you are both right. Um, they are not Jews 
who have been brought up under the law. They are not law driven. So, Tim, you're using the word rules. Are, they're not used to the rules and the regulations that governed the Jews. So, for the Jews, you listen to me, Chuck, please just uh, don't get angry with me. Just be patient with me because God wants you to hear this for a reason. There is a promised land to enter. So, listen to me. These two people, the centurion, he's not a Jew. He's a Gentile. The Syrophoenician woman, she's not a Jew. She's a Gentile. And Jesus Christ even told that clearly. That listen, the healing is bread for the Jews only, not for the dogs. So these are non-Jews. As a result, they don't know rules and regulations, statutes, commandments, ordinances. They have not been brought up with that. Keeping Sabbath day, keeping festivals and all, they have not been brought up that way. So they, they don't have that kind of fear that the law has put into the hearts of men. So listen to me. If you are law driven, I've told you what the law does. If you have been indoctrinated legalistically in religion, what will happen is that you will find out that you are performance driven. You will find out that you are constantly focused, preoccupied with yourself because the law is demanding. Thou shalt do this, thou shalt not do this, thou shalt do that. So that demand places pressure on yourself. So you free, so it gets to a point where you feel that the only way you can be blessed is if you fulfill a condition. And fulfilling a condition demands your own effort. That is, is a very um, tricky mindset that many people, they don't know it. But because they've been brought up that way, they feel that they, are, in fact, they are constantly on a treadmill to please God, one, to move God, two, to obtain God's favor, to score points to God. So they're feeling that there's things to do, things to do, things to do, things to do. Oh, I have to pray more. I have to fast. I'm not saying that praying more is, is there's anything wrong. In fact, praying is very good. But when you're thinking that it is the more I pray that the more God will answer you, that's, that's a problem. If you think that by fasting, I can move God and beseech God to move on this matter. That's the problem. That's, it shows um, a legalistic mind. So it, it, it's as if you are putting in effort to get God to move on your behalf. So, but these people, they didn't have all that kind of mindset. All we hear that is a man, a, a savior who is working miracles. Ah, I beg, I beg, just come, <laughs> speak the word. He's, there are no impeding thoughts in his mind. Now, let's now come down to scriptures. I didn't plan to say this, but let, let's come down to scriptures um, and show you how the Bible struggled with a lot of work to get us into that place of rest where you are not performance driven, you are not work driven, you are not preoccupied with yourself and with your effort, where you are just resting in the finished work. Listen to me, as a believer, the governing principle in the New Testament is rest. Do you hear what I'm saying? Rest. Which is the same principle that Moses enacted when he started the, promise, the journey to the promised land. Do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of God. How many of us can just decide to, you know what? I'm just standing still. Robert, but wait, 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 wait. There's deadline. There's deadline. You have, if you don't do this thing in the next three days, hey, something may happen to you. That is, I've told you that. Look, 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 look. Bank may be threatening. Ah, uh, if you don't do something, we're coming to send me bailiffs after you. And then you get all worked up. That getting worked up leads you to relieving actions. Those actions you are taking are to relieve your fear, to relieve your anxiety, to relieve your, 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 your uncertainty. You're just taking actions here and there. But look at what Moses said. Be quiet. Quiet in your spirit. Quiet in your emotions. 
quiet in the depths of your soul. Let the peace of Christ just rule. But Robert, that will be irresponsible of me. I need to show responsibility. I need to show that I'm responsible. I need to try out different options. Listen to me. There are three things that the Israelites need to do. In Exodus chapter 13, the pillar started leading them. So their responsibility is follow. Just follow, follow. In Exodus 14, God said, no, no, you just relax. Don't do anything. Trust me, I'll work at the resolution. What's the second thing they need to do? Trust. Trust. So follow for Exodus 14. Trust. Exodus 15. What happened in Exodus 15? They started thinking. Um, how do you say? A horse and a rider have been thrown into the sea. So they said, we're singing and praising God. Next thing you're meant to be, you, it's your responsibility, is praise God. So you have three responsibilities. Just follow him. Follow his instructions. Trust him and praise him. Is there, is there any work in that? No, there's no work. You only just follow him. The Satan says, go this way, go that way, go this way. I'm not trying to figure out the way to go. Because anytime I'm trying to figure out the way to go, I'm exerting energy. Then trust him. Trust means I'm not going to be anxious. I'm not going to be fearful. Because the moment you entertain fear or anxiety, then naturally you get into the mode called anxiety relieving mode. In other words, you'll be trying things to relieve yourself of the fear and the anxiety. Then praise him. Bible says Abraham was given glory to God even though against hope, he still believed in hope. What was he doing? Bible says he was giving glory to God. Three things. Follow him, trust him, and keep praising. Keep praising him. So, huh, I said that the principle for the New Testament is to rest. Now, what are you resting on? You have a marvelous, excellent premise to rest. And what are you resting in? The finished work of redemption and restoration. You are meant to rest in it. You are meant, listen to me very carefully, to keep experiencing and enjoying the benefits of the finished work. And they are, that, in fact, those of you that missed the beginning, I think you, what I'm going to do, because I didn't live stream it, but I'm going to, you know, put it up. I'll, I'll put it up. But we are talking about the, the benefits of the great salvation. So what you're meant to do is to, by faith, begin to enjoy the benefits of the finished work. We're meant to dwell in the salvation package that Christ has offered us. John 6, 35. I read it, I told you earlier. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. In other words, every lack, need is addressed. Those who are poor, those who are in penury, those who are impoverished, your situation will be addressed because it says, if you come to me, that's Jesus speaking, I'm the bread of life. If you come to me, you will never hunger. Then in Isaiah 55 verse 1, it says, listen to me very carefully. This is the word Bible says, ho! Oh, Everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the water. Your own is come. Just come to him. That's your response. He says, come ye to the waters. You that does not have money. In other words, you don't have purchasing power. He says, you just come. You, you can still buy. But he says, you're going to buy without money. Buy milk, buy wine, without money and without price. Pastor, how is that possible? There is a market where you buy without money and without price. In other words, there's no price label. Because there's no price label, you cannot use money to buy in this market. And this market, it says, how do you buy? 
I tell you, man. Verse 3 of that Isaiah 51 says, Incline your ear. Come unto me. Hear, in other words, listen, acknowledge, accept, believe. You don't have it. He says, if you do, your soul shall live. Your soul shall live. Church, there's a principle. But we, it's, it's very difficult to get into that realm. But if you get into that realm, man, you've entered, you've broken through into the promised land. And I mean it. I don't mean that today you are, you are resting, tomorrow you're out of rest. Today you're resting. To, it's an all-round resting. We never see any betrayal of anxiety in you or fear. We don't see you. We don't see you on that treadmill of anxiety relieving actions. Listen to what he says. This. If you are thirsty, thirst means you have a desire. There's something that is 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 desperately needed or a desperately a desperate desire. Come to the waters. What is the waters? Christ is the waters. The water I give to you, he says, it shall be in you a well springing up unto everlasting life. Come to the waters. That's what he says. You have no money. Don't come with money. You don't need money. Money is a symbol of the of your effort, your your skills, your whatever. No, no, don't don't come with money. Come and buy. But without money and without price. What is it the, the um, currency that's accepted? It's not money. There's no price limit. So what's the currency? It's faith. Just believe. This is not a joke. It is not a joke. Please, I beg all of us. It will give the pastor a lot of joy to see all of you breaking through into the promised land. Many are still going through wilderness. You know why he couldn't bring them into the promised land 10 years after they left Egypt? Because that is the length of time it took to purge out unbelief from that nation. And by that 40 years, every adult above 20 will most likely have died. God said, the only people that I will allow to enter into the promised land are the people who are 20 years and below. Because every other person had a, a problem of believing. In fact, the only other two people that entered, do you know that Moses himself didn't enter? Moses himself, he, Moses had a, he said a bit of unbelief. What was the unbelief? Speak to the rock. Speak to the rock. He struck the rock. Listen to me. Eh? God is pushing us into experiences of effortlessness. Effortlessness. God is trying to mortify our flesh. God is trying to remove works from our mindset. And Apostle Paul understands this concept so well that he labored and labored. That's why Apostle Paul is the only one that spoke vocifer vociferously against the law. Because he knows that what drives people into works is the law. And so he said, look, 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 if it's grace, if it's grace, then there are no works. If there are works, then it's not grace. Romans, I think, 9 or 13. So, the New Testament principle is a resting, a resting. Resting in what? You are resting in the finished work. Why? Because the principle of success or prosperity is on the premise of rest. There are no works. And Moses started, he says, stand still. Can we not just be stand still? What are you waiting for? You've tried and tried your own effort. You are still where you are. Why don't you just calm down? Why don't you just let go? Do you want your situation to be like Abraham? 
Do you know why it took Abraham 25 years? 25 years from the day of promise to the day of the fulfillment of the promise. Because there were still options. One of the options that was still ringing in their head, sleep with my housemaid. He went and slept with the housemaid. Why? Why did he have? Because he had the strength to sleep with the housemaid. You get to a stage as a man where you don't have any power to sleep with any woman. That is why when God worked the miracle at that 99 years old, he had no, uh, there was no strength in him. Don't wait till that time. Don't let us wait till that time. When God has made you exhaust all options, just learn, cultivate. Because this promised land, let me tell you how you know when you've entered the promised land. Let me show, for some of you, let me tell you. Eh? When you have a, when you even have a desire, just have a desire. It's a desire. You have not even voiced it out. God accomplishes it. I'm going to read to you. In, in, in fact, when you get to read Deuteronomy chapter eight, I think it's verses. 7, 8, and 9, where God tells us what the promised land is going to be like. The Bible says that in that promised land, there are brooks, streams, fountains, um, springs, hills and valleys, and water is just flowing all over the place. Water is flowing over, and it drinks water from the heavens. These waters are supplied from the heavens. Waters, that's how the land of promise. The same thing Jesus Christ said, the, he, he, out of your belly, if any man thirsts, out of his belly shall flow rivers. God is telling you, you will always be hydrated spiritually, emotionally, psychologically, financially. Hydrated means there's water. There's water. The financial thirst, the emotional thirst, the marital thirst, the uh, psychological thirst, the intellectual thirst, the career thirst, all of them, there will be more than enough waters. But these waters will come. By believing, not labor. It says in Egypt, you had to water your garden on foot. You had to water your garden. You have to carry buckets, whatever, to be watering your garden. But this place, hey, 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 the rivers, there are fountains, there are depths of waters. It says you will eat your bread to the full. In other words. The land of promise is a place of guaranteed satisfaction. Not labor. You don't, you're not laboring. Please, stop it. Stop. Let go. Just let go. <laughs> let me tell you. Let me tell you a radical approach. If I perish, let me perish. I'm, I'm tired. I'm tired of my effort. I'm just sitting back. I'm not. And Lord, your counsel stand. Your will be done. Your purpose be established. Be enthroned. Be enthroned, Lord, your will be done. Your counsel stand. I'm not, if I perish, let me perish. Do you know how I got into divine help? You know how I got into divine help? When I saw it, I, nobody had taught me. I didn't hear it. The only person I heard say something about divine help was Pastor Deboe. When he said, he, he said, if God cannot heal me, that's it. That's what he said. This was 1991 or 92. And then I was reading uh, Isaiah 53 on my own. And when I was in this Isaiah 53, I was suffering from what is called, uh, what's they call that fever? Yeah, is it yellow fever? Or I, I can't remember. Wong fever that used to afflict many people then. Is it yellow fever? I don't remember. When you have the load you with prescriptions. Mama, what do you need? Mm -hmm. Eh? Typhoid. Mm -hmm. Mama, Mama, we're hearing you, please. Please. Uh, typhoid? Ty thank you. Typhoid. Yeah. That's it. Typhoid. Typhoid fever. I was suffering from typhoid fever. Then I just read Isaiah 53. Ah! By sight and healed. He was wounded for my transcription. I read it. You know what? Just bundled my drug. Nobody taught me. Nobody. I, on my own. Threw it off. And this typhoid came. You know how this typhoid came? I went on a seven-day dry fast. Ask me what more about it. I'm the new believer. I'm exploring power. I wanted to say power. I wanted to say power. No, but I lacked knowledge. I lacked wisdom. How can you be going on seven days fast? On the sixth day, I broke down. Sixth day of my dry fast, I broke down. <laughs> then I went to tell you, say you have typhoid. Jesus. I'm fasting, seeking for power. I'm ending up with typhoid. 
Caravan. <laughs> so I said, I brought him with this figure. And then I had a devil. You see, God cannot heal. I just told him, I said, you know what? I'm not interested. It, um, um, all this drugs. I, mean, I threw them in the bucket. I threw them in the bin. And sat and just waited. I used to have radical faith. I didn't think God just helped us to continue. I just got well. I got well. From that day, 1991, 1992, I do remember. From that day, that was it. I don't depend on any doctor to heal me. I don't. I mean, I'm not saying you have to do that. Too. Please, I'm, please, I beg you. Just flow at your level. <laughs> flow at your level. Don't flow at my level until you get to that level. Some people can take them 10 days. Some can take them to, to, I mean, 10 years, 20 years, 40 years. But for me, I'm determined that I was determined that you know what? I am going to rest in the Lord. It was Isaiah 53 I was reading. So we get to a point where I'm going to show you some more scriptures and then we'll close. Jesus said, you that labor, you that are heavily laden, he has asked you to do one thing. Come to me. And he said, you will find rest for your soul. Tell the Lord, I stand on the truth of your promise. Why is your soul so troubled? Why? It's your undoing. It's your undoing. Speak peace to your soul. My soul, thou shall not be restless. Thou shall not be disquieted. The peace of Christ rules in my heart. Jesus said, I have rest for my soul in him. I will give you rest. That's what Jesus Christ said. Jesus said, him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. If any man thirst, let him come. Come to Jesus. Embrace Jesus. Focus on Jesus. Enthrone Jesus. Engage Jesus. Enjoy Jesus. Experience Jesus. He says, you will drink. And when you drink, from me. Rivers of living waters will flow out of your belly. When you come believing, I'm going to generate more than enough waters to quench every thirst. Don't let this thing, I don't say everybody's just talking, talking. No, this is the crux. God wants to solve your. Let me tell you enough of the wilderness experience, enough of the desert experience. The prophetic word came on Thursday that your desert will be converted into the garden of the Lord. What is garden of the Lord? It's simply ending to the land of promise. Some people are still on the periphery. They can't enter. The Israelites, what did they see? They saw giants. When you see giants, it provokes and triggers fear relieving actions. When you get into fear relieving actions, then you are frustrating grace. That's where the Bible says, if it is works, then grace can't function. And what is grace? It is where you begin to enjoy the benevolence, the generosity, the goodness of God without earning it freely. When you come to buy with money, you find that there's nothing you'll be able to purchase from that supermarket. Because it says money will not, is not a legal tender in this supermarket. When we say money means once you come with any trace of effort, you don't make, you see, you can't, you can't mix grace and faith. Bible says it is through faith that we access grace. If you try to access grace through works, you want to work for it, you want to earn it, you want to de 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 merit it, it will not work. You will keep going round and round in circles. Many of us, you can smell it. You can smell your inheritance. It's just there. But you can't lay hold of it. Can you just stand still? Come to him. You will encounter, engage, experience, and enjoy him. Let me tell you. We'll close now. Why is it that you come to Jesus? You know why? Listen, listen. I want everyone, all ears to be listening. He is the word that was in the beginning. With God. That was God. 
and by whom all things. You're not coming to an ordinary person. You're not coming to a, just a God. You are coming to the word that was with God, that was God, and by whom and for whom all things were made. That's the person you're coming to. So know who you're coming to. He's the son of man. There's nothing made that was made without him. He's not just the, the, the omnificient God. He's also the uh, redeemer of all things. All things are redeemed by him. He's the way. He's the truth. He's the life. That's the person you're coming to. He has the authority to deliver life to anyone he wants. Says, as the Father has a death in himself and give it life to anyone, so has the Son life in himself and the, gives life to whoever he wants. He has the authority to raise the dead. He has the authority. That's, these are the things that Jesus Christ said in the John 5 or so. He, had, he said the Father has given the authority to the Son of Man to raise anyone he wants back to life. He says the Father has given unto the Son authority to execute the judgment. That's the person you're coming to. He has the authority of life. He has the authority to bring back to, to from the dead to life. He has the authority to execute judgment. He's the ransom of your soul. He's the propitiation of your sins. He's your justification. He's your redemption. He's the all-sufficing vicarious sacrifice. Once yeah. and for all final sacrifice, complete and eternal, efficacious sacrifice. That's who is. That's the person you're coming to. You're not coming to an ordinary person. The high priest, whose high priesthood is of the order of Melchizedek. In other words, it is sworn by God, and it's an eternal high priesthood. He's our advocate. We fear nothing. He's the mediator of what we call the eternal covenant. He's the, the mediator of the new, the, the last will testament. He's the shorty, the guarantor that this testament must be a reality in your life. He's the guarantor. The, you know, God didn't give you a testament without guarantor. He's the shorty, the mediator. He mediated it for you. He cut it out for you. It was, there's no covenant between you and God. The covenant was between you and God. Then he's there to guarantee that you can have it if you come to him. Guess what? This person you're coming to, when you come to him, you see him as a redeemer who has redeemed me and you from every curse of the law. Redeemed you from the condemnation of the law. Redeemed you from every controversy that may be festering around your life. Every controversy. He silences them. He blots them out. He expunges them from your heavens. You are not a controversial figure before the heavens. Discharged and acquitted. He's the one that does it. He's the one that has the ability. He sets captives free from captivity. He removes you from every cave, every cocoon, and every containment. Once you come to him, you cannot remain in caves. You can't remain cocooned. You can't remain contained. He, he breaks off all the containments, the cocoon membranes. He breaks them off and brings you out into limelight. That's the person you're coming to. Remitted all your sins through his own blood. He himself, he, he brought the blood that wiped off completely your sins. And he's the one that guarantees that your sins will never remember, never be remembered again. He gave you his own spirit, the spirit of divinity, indwelling this your earthly treasure. Catarabal Huteria. That's the one we're coming to. You know what? He took me out, uprooted me from my ancestral lineage that is cursed, and grafted me into a divine lineage. That's eternally blessed. This one, this, this Jesus, Bible says he's the heir of, the, of God. He said it. All things have been delivered into my custody. All. All, without exception. Governments, nations, resources, they're my custody. I have the administrative oversight of all things. 
But this Jesus, he's the one that has made me a co-heir with him. He's given me an inheritance. I'm no longer a servant. I'm no longer a slave. He makes it possible for me to live and exist as the heir of God. And so I live with the full consciousness of the great inheritance that's available to me. Bible says we have obtained an inheritance. Have made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. An inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, that faded not away, it cannot be corrupted, reserved in heaven for you. It is because of him I have what the Bible calls exceedingly great, listen to my words, exceedingly great and precious promises. Those exceedingly great and precious promises, it is because of him they are yea and amen. They are guaranteed in him and they are executed in him in my life. All those exceedingly great, without him, you can have exceedingly great and precious promises, but if they are not guaranteed, if they don't become reality, it doesn't make sense. Bible says the Gentiles, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Because of him, that we become partakers of the promise. Well, you know what you're called? You're called an heir of the promise. God is more abundantly determined to demonstrate the immutability of his promise to the heirs of promise. And that's true Christ. The Bible says two immutable things. One, the promise, and two, the oath. God gave the promise, and then God swore an oath. Those are two immutable things. But who makes it a reality? Who executes it? Who brings it to pass in your life? It's Christ Jesus. That's why he says, come to him. Come to him. That promise of blessings by which God utilized two immutable things to prove and demonstrate that he's determined to do this. Just go to Christ. You'll see the reality. What he has promised, he's able to perform it in and through Christ. Is that making sense? Now, Bible say, okay, let me not say Bible. I wrote this, that Christ has made every promise to be judicially expedient and legitimate and legally binding. In other words, it is because of Christ I can actually legitimately, legally, not out of partiality or favoritism, no. There's a judici judicial premise, legitimate and legally binding premise for me to be a partaker of every bless, every promise. What Jesus Christ did was he removed any possible disqualification in my life. He took it and then granted me what is called eternal un un unconditional qualification. So he guarantees my qualification using his own merits for me. So another word to say is that Jesus is my judicial guarantor. He's my judicial shorty. He's the executor of the will, the living executor. He's not dead. He's a living executor of the last will or the last will testament. All, promise, all promises are fulfilled in him. Let's take out the communion. Will you come to him or will you not come to him? Can you just throw yourself on him? Tell him, Jesus, 
I'm weary. I'm a wearied soul. I've come to find refuge in you. I'm tired of scheming and planning. I'm tired of thinking. I'm tired of strategizing without you. I come to the waters to buy milk and wine without money and without price. You said I should incline my ear. You said I should sama sama. In other words, listen, listen. You said my soul will be fat. If I, all, I, all I need to do is listen. Jesus, you said, if any man is this, let him come unto me. I come to the word that was in the beginning with God. That was God, and by whom all things were made. He's a living executor of all promises. Jesus, I look you into the face, and I do acknowledge you as my judicial guarantor of the New Testament. I sense your life flooding my soul. I sense you by your own power surging me into the promised land. Surging me into the promised land. The Bible says, as soon as they crossed Jordan, into the promised land, manna from heaven ceased. Let me tell you, manna from heaven was for the journey through the wilderness. When God is giving you, you know, he's, it's as if he has to be feeding you. Be, you do understand, he's, he's giving you manna from heaven. So he's, he's like he's dropping it, dropping towards you. But a time will come when it will be a different experience. You come into your own inheritance where you can see all the provisions around you. Not just for yourself, but you now become a blessing to nations. What is stopping you from entering that promised land? You know the biggest problem? I haven't forgotten, I haven't forgotten what they're going to come in, but I just want to, I, to, I promise myself, well, whatever happens, I will read this scripture to you. Galatians. Chapter 4. I'll read verse 1. Sorry, chapter 5. Verse 1, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ had made you free, be not, listen, be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. You know what the yoke of bondage is? Legalism. It says, if you go back to circumcision, Christ profits you nothing. If you go back to trying to seek, score, seek favor and score points with God through works, Christ profits you nothing. Christ is our promised land. Christ is the land of rest. Do not trust any longer in the works of the flesh. The body of Christ. This body bore all my transgressions, bore all my iniquities, bore 
all my errors, my failures, my shortcomings. He bore them in his body and suffered the chastisement, the wrath of God was meted out unto him. The fiery indignation of God against sin and all transgressions was meted out unto Christ in his body. And thereby he satisfied all demands of justice against me. And as I believe, in the all-sufficing vicarious sacrifice, I'm absolved from all judgment, and I can partake of the life of God. I can receive confidently the ministry of the quickening power of the Spirit that dwells in me. Let us eat. Close your eyes. Let's close your eyes. I don't know what Jesus Christ is ministering to you. For some of you to be peace, some of you to be assurance, some of you to be comfort, comfort, comfort. When you're comforted, you are calmed. When you are calmed, you are rested. When you are rested, it's a powerful platform for miracles, signs, wonders, for the move of the Spirit. You take up this cup and you say, Father, I thank you. It's the cup of the blood of your son, Jesus. The blood that was shed for the remission of my sins. The blood through which speakings, I receive comfort. The speakings of the blood in this cup ministers comfort to my soul. Ministers calmness to my soul. Ministers quietness to my soul. Moses said, be quiet. Moses said, be calm. Moses said, just stand still. Calmness. A lot of noise, a lot of noise. Satan will keep generating noise around you. But if you determine, you have the final control over your soul, that my soul will not be disquieted, but my soul will be calm as I proclaim the peace of Christ over my soul because of the blood that was shed for my justification. The blood that settled all the controversies in my life. The blood that guaranteed me a secure future. The blood that even redeemed every second, every hour, and the totality of my future redeemed from the jurisdiction of Satan and the wickedness of this world. The blood by which I come nigh unto the throne of grace. The Bible says the blood brings me nigh. It makes it possible for me to come into the bosom of God. The blood that has cancelled all condemnation and nullified every possible accusation against me. The blood by which speaking I'm completely discharged and acquitted. Every court where they seek to prosecute me, anywhere in the heavens, on the earth, beneath the oceans, the blood Cancels all those prosecutors, prosecutions, and proclaims me discharged and acquitted. The blood gives you access, legitimate access, to the entire promises of God. Let us drink. Church. <sighs> To this message, 
I don't know whether I've exhausted it. I don't know. But if I've not, I trust that the Holy Spirit will further expound it to you as it relates to you. So you know where you are in your spiritual journey into the promised land. Because we must all break into that promised land. Roman, Deuteronomy 8, I think it's verses 7, 8, and 9. I'm going to just keep reading. It describes the promised land. He says you will build houses in the promised land. He says you'll be settled. You will eat your bread to the fullest. There will be no scarceness. You have all the things. It's there. It's flowing. Waters are flowing. That's the most important thing. Waters like streams, like like uh, fountains, like rivers. We locate where we are and we determine before this month runs out. It becomes our experience that we're all established in the promised land. We have crossed. You see, when they crossed into it, manna from heaven stopped because they had entered into the inheritance. Manna from heaven stopped. They were now generating the manna. They were in the land where manna was being generated. So not just for them, for they can be a blessing to the world. Listen, believe it. Trust it. Listen to this message. Not just this message, but we'll go, there's, another, there's another part to this service that's not streamed. I'll go and work on it where we talked about the benefits of the great salvation. Listen to it. Just keep listening to it because something will happen. Something will happen. Light, a lot of light will turn into you because there has to be a paradigm shift. There has to be a renewal of mind, a change of mindset. And then when that thing happens, you will just discover, boom, like the chick popping out of the, of the shell. And it's a new world for you. No more suffering. No more struggling. No more delays. I'm not spending 40 years in this wilderness. I'm not. Let me tell you, 40 years, God provided for them. God gave them food. God protected them. But they were wasting. It was wasting because it is aimless journey. If they were just going around in circles. I don't want that. Purpose. I must fulfill purpose. I must fulfill destiny. So I'm not just floating around, just floating around, uh, floating around. No, 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 no. Uh, my life is purpose-driven. There is an agenda that God has, and I'm cooperating with him to get into it. And one of the first things is I must break in. There must be a crossing of the River Jordan to get into the Promised Land. I don't need to be depending on manna from heaven, which is what happens in the wilderness. I'm exiting the wilderness, I'm exiting the desert, I'm entering into that land that flows with milk and honey. In the mighty name of Jesus, I want you to say all amen. 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 Take out your offerings. So is seed. Let this seed be a token of your faith in this word of the promised land. Let this seed be, yes, I'm expressing faith in the fact that all that I have acknowledges of you. And as I have released this unto you, I trust that I begin to see indisputable evidence of the promised land in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless, Amen. God bless you all. Powerfully and awesomely. Amen. Amen. Pastor, I don't, I don't want it to end. I just thought you would you could continue. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so blessed. So blessed. Thank you, sir. Thank what of God so is sweet. Much. It's a sweet. Yes. Mm. What of God is sweet. Thank you so much. It's sweet. 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 Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You, Pastor. Pastor. Thank you so much. God bless you. Yes, I feel a lot of anointing. I keep talking. I feel a lot of anointing. You receive it. Receive it. Just receive it. Amen. 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 I receive. Amen. Amen. I receive. I receive. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you so much, Pastor Robert.
God bless you. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye.